For those of you who could come out uh, into the room and those of you who are playing along at home, uh, cross my fingers, this is my third go at driving the Zoom technology and I think I've got it right for the first time today. Um, so, but please come back, Robin, if you watch this. Um, so yeah, we're really lucky uh, to have Dr. Guzio Hill today. Um, you can read so you can see what the, uh, the topic is all about. Um, but so I give everyone a little bit of a warning heads up. I'm sorry to keep doing this, but there's going to be some crowd participation involved. So get ready to get involved and I'll be walking around with the microphone. Uh, but so just a little bit of a background here. Uh, so Guzio has, um, is trained as both a civil and a common lawyer. And, and she asked me if I knew what both of those things were. And I said, no. So maybe you can help us out uh, with that one as the seminar rolls on. Uh, but so she's worked in commercial law practice uh, for the Office um, of the Parliamentary Council as a leg legislative drafter. Um, she's the author of, is the camera on me? This book, uh, National Uniform Legislation. Um, and 85 sets of uniform acts across Australia. So um, the goal for today is to talk about how um, work can get aligned with informing public policy. More than enough for me, over to you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dylan. Thank you, Sam, for inviting. Thank you for attending. Uh, just a couple of things, introduction. So lawyer admitted as solicitor to the NT, and uh, I worked as an academic both at the NU and CDU. My research is on national uniform legislation, harmonization, but I was drafting in, in the Northern Territory specifically. And I don't know if it's relevant or not, but I just put it there. I'm also on National Committee for Regulators. That's, and I don't know if some people know it, ANZOC and ACOP, uh, some people don't. And of course, uh, parents, <laughs> of course, our kids go to same school. So some couple of my examples will be about parenting because uh, how many of you have kids? Oh, fabulous. Fab oh, everybody. That's fantastic. So that's easy example straight away. And uh, legislative drafter, that's our parliament. And I worked there. And the joke we had at the time was we are not reading legislation. We are writing legislation. So that's what we used to do. We, some of my friends are still there. And uh, so that's a little bit about me. So I just want to find out a little bit about you. Uh, fantastic, what's great about it. We know uh, already a lot of you. And uh, maybe just uh, as uh, Dylan said, it's crowd participation. <laughs> so maybe if you could just share your expertise on what you're already doing, on aligning public uh, for public policy impact and or why do you think we need to think about public policy impact? So Dylan, it's we'll a, start with you. I was about to pass it to Gabby. <laughs> no. ah. All right, so yeah, so my name's Dylan Irvine. Um, the area that I work in is in water resources uh, with typically with a focus on groundwater. Why do I think we need to, what, what do we, why do, we why do I need to think about impact? Uh, you need to think about impact, otherwise what's the point of doing anything? <laughs> Um, and my experience with aligning uh, my research for public policy impact. So I get to cheat a little bit because we were talking earlier. So I said uh, previously that I don't necessarily think that a lot of my work has policy implications, but it's more maybe management, which is the step before. Um, but maybe I'll leave it at that um, for now. Fantastic. Thank you, Dylan. Hi, I'm Gabby Minigo. Uh, my area in, of research is immunology. And why do we need impact? I think I agree with Dylan, like the, doing the research needs to lead to something. Um, otherwise it would be unethical wasting money on it. Um, my experience with aligning my research for public policy, impact, uh, very little I would have thought. So with immunology, my view was always, how can my research help with designing vaccines? So rather than public policy, it's like designing a product that then could go uh, working on basic research towards improving products to then um, deliver health outcomes. I but guess. then as we saw with COVID, public uh, vaccine can become a public absolutely, policy. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. In a longer term, indirect yeah. way. Fabulous. Uh, my name is Acacio Guterres from Timor-Leste. Um, my expertise is actually in agriculture. Uh, so I was thinking that probably through agriculture can improve the food availability for poor people in Timor-Leste. And of course, that one is like looking for the food security 
and income generation, as well as for the food nutrition for the kids in Timor Leste. So that one's looking for the impacts of the agriculture on the on the livelihood in Timor Leste. Fantastic social outputs and economic. So I'm David McKenzie. I'm with College of Health. My research is about farmers' adaptive responses to the changing climates, and I'm particularly interested in uh, the impact side of things. Like, how do we? Um, I've, I've got a paper that I'm doing on socio-cognitive um, settings, and and I'm particularly um, my research is taking me down to the uh, I guess the efficacy of groups in strengthening farmers working together, thinking differently, um, I guess the, um, I guess collaborating and experiential exchange of, of knowledge and sharing and how that filters out across the community as a sphere of influence and it's more powerful than just the individual farmer working by themselves. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. And so if you're playing at home or in your office, you could maybe type them into the chat and we can have a look at them later. <laughs> Yes, that's a good idea. So I'm Kamal. Uh, my area of expertise is ecological economics, which is a bit of social economics and, and ecological systems. I think it's having some impact, but I'm here to learn more how to have a bit bigger uh, impact. Um, so I do align my research with public policy. For example, I worked in areas of like wildfire management, yep. costing wildfires costing the damage from wildfires, the losses that we experienced, especially for indigenous communities. A lot of that in research informs into indigenous well-being policies, how we can involve indigenous peoples living out in remote locations to work on country and how that's cost savings for the government. Fabulous. Um, and also in emergency management. Um, so we are trying to actually change the current paradigm where it's like teams from away from remote communities go into the communities to deliver emergency management services while we are saying the rangers are trained there. So building up the economic policy case for that. And also in agriculture, applying a bit of bottom-up approach, talking with the growers, uh, yes. actually what they need. So it's mm -hmm. like assessing the costs and benefits from their perspectives, what they want their growing systems to be looking like in the future, while the government has got you know, different kind of developing the north kind of policies. So my main focus is more about developing resilient circular kind of economies, which are local. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you for sharing. Okay, thank you. Natasha, as soon as Natasha came in, uh, I was like intimidated <laughs> straight away. <laughs> Spot on. <laughs> Hi, I'm Natasha. I'm an applied environmental anthropologist. And actually most of our work around livelihoods and marine management and conservation is looking at the impact of policy on people and different aspects of their livelihoods, as well as doing research to inform development of um, policies that recognise the rights and needs of local people. Natasha is also a mentor for ECIs. And once I was looking at the impact and I asked, Natasha, look at this impact. It's really good case study. She says, yes, we wrote it. <laughs> I guess it was Australian Research Council. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was involved in that. <laughs> um, so I'm Stephen Garnas. I work on conservation biology. One of the areas I've been working on is policy to prevent species extinction and the latest threatened species strategy is evidence that we're getting through the right people it's, and your your impact is so creative in the sense that uh, the that aria that, that was from you wasn't it that aria album oh, oh yes, yes 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 that, yes. that was one of the most creative ideas I could think of, yes? Very difficult to know whether that got through to policymakers, but, uh, oh, but it's definitely, certainly entertained. It's engagement. <laughs> it's certainly engagement, and it's certainly engagement on a human level. Um, Thank you, Sam. I'm Sam, also broadly a conservation biologist, but um, with a specific disciplinary expertise in 
genetics when I can remain focused on that. Um, and particularly sort of how you apply genetic data and genetic analyses to um, biodiversity research and conservation. Um, uh, example of alignment with policy impact. I remember when I first came here chatting to anti-government flora and fauna about do you have a policy around using genetics for threatened species conservation and management and the answer was no we don't because we've got no data so why have a policy when there's no information to frame it so four years later we have some data and so we're setting up a workshop with NTGov, WAGov and a few NGOs for early next year on mm. sort of um you know what's the context today and how I might use that information to set up a sort of genetic management framework for threatened species policy whether it's useful or not is another matter but it sounds like we've done something in four years so. all right yeah there's one in the chat yeah thanks phenomenal thank you so much thank you for sharing i'll just make it bigger so jenny i work on fisheries together yeah uh from gender perspective i think my research can inform some priority areas that the government of timor leste has i also think I have a responsibility to my study participants to amplify their voices and make sure they get some benefit from participating in the research. Phenomenal answers. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's exactly where we are going. Uh, that's exactly what we are discussing today. So when we think about dissemination and uh, engagement, uh, there are a couple of approaches. Sometimes we think let it happen, but nobody in this room demonstrated this approach. Then we are talking about help it happen. And most of you in this room are already in the category of make it happen. For well, some four years, that the database and policy has happened within four years, yes? Well, With policy happened, yeah. I'm being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that's quite quite so, amazing yeah. result in itself. So yeah. here in the room. And of course. Of course, when we are talking about knowledge transfer, we want to, we are scientists, we want th to think about beautiful, wonderful diagrams, and we always think that it works a little bit like this. When we are adapting knowledge, we are selecting knowledge, we are synthesizing, and we are uh, providing evidence based policies. But in reality, sometimes well, we do see opinion based policies, although policymakers are now pressed for more and more evidence-based uh, data uh, in uh, informing the policy. And sometimes, sometimes, as you know, you will have the cases where, okay, so a minister wants this particular policy to be in place, and uh, here's the ministerial, and uh, first attorney general, and then we are working on certain policy. And so and another good thing to think about it as a scientist, I think, is the fact sometimes we are carried away by the fact, is it worth, worthy of being a policy? Is it good enough? Do we know? How do we know it's going to work? Or is it good enough policy? But the chance is, if you have researched it, and all of you have, uh, it's good enough, at least policy, because it's already supported by sufficient evidence, at least from literature, or maybe if, uh, like we, Jenny said, from the participants. So a ch the chance is it's good enough policy. And uh, in our experience, we have seen some really bad policies. So at least if it comes from real, we think already that at least it's not opinion-based policy, that there is at least some su substantial evidence there. Uh, really? Oh, flattering. <laughs> Thank you, Penny. Hi. We just introduced ourselves and we just talked a little bit about our areas. And... Oh, I said that wasn't going to happen this okay. week. Okay, sorry, we just want to let you know, and then um, she's just great. I'll pass you that. She quickly introduced herself. I'm going to see if I can. Sure. Um, so, I think I pretty much know everyone. Um, Penny Vaughan, so environmental um, scientist and member of REAL. And hi, everyone. Vam Shi here. I'm Plan Biosecurity Officer from Plan Biosecurity and Take Government. Fantastic. Thank you so much. 
Thank you for introducing. So when we are thinking about uh, alignment of public policy and our research, it can happen only two ways. And we already heard about this both ways. If you could guess which two ways it can happen. There are only two ways it can happen. How we can align our research with the public policy. One way, exactly right. So that's engagement, that's bottom up. So we are driving the change from the bottom. And the second one, you were discussing, you were talking about it. When you basically align your research already, you look at the policy, you look at the, I don't know, um, some program, national program, domestic violence program right now. They're talking about eradicating domestic violence within one generation. And so this is a, a big topic right now. So that's the other one. So really from now on, what we will be talking about is top down and bottom up. And really, these are the only two ways. And of course, there is a combination. There can be a combina combination of them both. For example, here, we have Australian Law Reform Commission has uh, issued five main goals on which they wanted to work on. That happened pre-COVID. So I don't know, it might change with COVID. But uh, afterwards, UNSW already selected automated decision making. So that's where, where they went. Uh, then University of Melbourne was looking at defamation. So that's defamation. And some other universities were looking at press freedom and whistleblowers in Queensland. Sorry, I forgot the university name. And then uh, they have here legal structures for social in entrepreneurs. And that's an important topic. But uh, I don't think Australian Law Reform Commission is looking at it anymore. And I talked to the Australian Securities and Investment Commission commissioner, he came to Darwin. And I said, I asked him whether they're looking at uh, additional structures, legal structures for social in enterprises. And they said no. But they did say if there is something that is going to be driven from NT, they will look at it as well. So it can, it can happen. And same, uh, so this is bottom up. So you engage and then it results in an agenda set setting, of course, if especially you have good relationships with ministries, which all of us here do, uh, usually, usually, usually we, we uh, ministries here in NT are a bit more accessible. Uh, so we usually, at least even in social settings, we already know some of our ministries, we can talk, we can discuss some things here. When we're talking about top-down alignment, and you have probably done that, we have to speak legal language. That's what they understand. And that's why I highlighted for you, that's how you cite legislation. So basically, this is in italics. We are very particular, lawyers are very particular. I'm sorry about that. But yes, so uh, the name of the act in the italics and brackets, that's Commonwealth. And then you are talking about review. And then, uh, so it's, if it's framed already in the language that the public policy officers can understand, they, there is a bigger chance for your research to be picked up and get that alignment from the top down straight away. Anyone had, uh, of course, we have such an expertise in the room. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people probably have done it already, yes? Yes, people are nodding, so that's fantastic. So the key with this, area is probably talking the same language, talking the same language as public policy offices, as drafters and uh, people who are making decisions. Okay, and then we, the, so we, we have a little bit discussed here already. Any additional? Maybe you can share how, what was your experience in alignment? So we had right to development in North Agenda. That Fantastic. Out, yeah, the white example. paper came out in 2015. Um, I mean, there was so much into it that you could write a lot about that. So, um, so we tried to actually address some of the issues, the area that I, I work in. Um, so that kind of helped. We did submit Senate inquiries. You know, there were some, so we wrote responses to that. 
Um, that was quite good because we were invited to the parliament house with the uh, you know, panel to have that discussion. So I had a bit of say there. Um, so that's one channel. And the other is like we had that bushfires Royal Commission that was set up. So we sent the response to that one the same way. Some but then they asked for some of the publications, which was quite nice because in you one know, of the yeah. publications, we assessed the cost of wildfires across Northern Australia. So that was quite highly ranked by them uh, saying that we haven't seen this kind of study before, that we want more of this. Yeah, you know, so yeah. some of that work kind of helps and one of my area of research is that I look at the values that don't flow in the market. So one is that, you know, the simple economic analysis that will be easily interpreted through the market costs and benefits. But the hard ones are like the loss of natural land, uh, mm -hmm. probably in this context, I can say, you know, more protected areas or managed areas by the traditional owners and all that. So there is no cost or benefit in terms of assessing wildfire losses. So when we assess the loss of ecosystem services, we're applying different techniques. I don't want to dig into those ones. Yes, yes. Really that good. made a bit of sense to them. Uh, you know what we lose, even if there is no loss of human life, but there is a loss of so many other things. So I just want to deconstruct it a little bit more. Sure. So what happened here? We have agenda, uh, so developing north. It can be extremely political as uh, I just don't want to uh, glamorize it. And we are talking about only positive things. We will talk about uh, negative side to it as well. So we're developing North and this is a big agenda. You have sub made submissions, which is fantastic. And they were accepted. Mm -hmm. And then we had Royal Commission into the fires. And then uh, the Royal Commission commented on how wonderful it is. As a researcher, as a researcher, this is fabulous work. You have done your job. Okay. as a researcher uh, sometimes of course with royal commissions and we can see it all the time with royal commissions we will uh, see something submissions go in royal commission took place and then they will say something like this in the media royal commission has failed its mission because it's not the job of royal commission royal commission investigates provides report that's it the job of royal commission is finished they can't change the law. They can't do anything else. They can provide uh, recommendations to the government. Government can accept or not accept. And it's not uh, unusual for government not to accept recommendations. Or they can also accept, but not implement these recommendations. Also possible. But as researchers, we have done our job. Uh, our findings are in the Royal Commission. Ideally, of course, we get a uh, citation out of it, yes. Uh, quote out of it so in the uh, for the engagement you can show the impact and you can show that you have done your job Natasha uh, I want to draw on your experience because I'm sure you have some valuable stories here do you have yes I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, so let's see so last year we published an article in the conversation which was Critical, critical um, criticizing the federal government, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, about the way they were treating um, illegal Indonesian fishermen under the yes. Australian Fisheries Management Act. And as a result, AFMA has asked um, the Australian government, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, to, to support a project to try and come up with some better alternatives to avoid people breaking the law basically so I guess that's a and then they've asked us as research experts in this area to undertake a project to address that so that's one example really good example that's a really good example and you straight away is only because we know each other as well so you worked with the barrister as well who is specializing in this area so William Forsties uh, that's William Forsties Chambers in the city they have civil law, so it's uh, commercial barristers who are specializing in anything but criminal law. That's probably easier. Uh, majority of practice of lawyers here in Darwin is criminal law, 95% criminal law, 
and then everything else goes to William Foster's chambers. And William Foster's chambers is when we have uh, barristers specializing, like L Lima. She 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 was on the tribunal. She she was specializing in quite amazing international law subjects as well. So, and Natasha, you have met each other, and then presented at the conference as well together yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of separate that's, that's a separate, separate okay type of illegal fishing more industrial illegal fishing but but relevant yeah yeah so. okay so engagement uh, sometimes barristers are already representing some fishermen obviously she was representing indonesian fishermen yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I don't know i mean on that sort of legal side of things i don't know how successful we can be in actually changing a piece of legislation um, when it comes to these kinds of issues because of sensitivities around things like national security and sovereignty and boundaries versus changing a, a more, I guess, local piece of legislation around, I don't know, threatened species, more, you know, at a territory level as opposed to a national level. I think there's, you know, how can research actually have an impact on legislative changes? That's probably the whole question itself. I don't know if you've got anything to say about that still. Yeah, so legislation is the next step, if you like, if you can change policy to start with, uh, um, institutionalizing it in a legislative change is, is more difficult, but ultimately you're trying to influence that so, mm -hmm. to give it some greater longevity. Um, I might just talk about an approach I've taken to influencing policy with threatened species, which is to invite the senior public servants across the country to be part of the research is what happened in a paper did published this year on um, most imperiled species. And we had representatives from all the different states and the NT as part of our authorship team, part of our oh, research yeah. team. And so they were able to take that through to the policy stage and it's now in the National Threatened Species Strategy that mm -hmm. all the species we identified in some form have managed to get in there as being prioritized for conservation. Phenomenal, phenomenal example. So yes, of course, anti-government, anti-legislation will be easier to change. It's more open for lobbying and more open, open for influence, our influence here. And of course, national policy will be harder to change. And of course, of course, of course, this is, but you already gave really, really good example of how your conversation article and your research have change the policy this is haven't changed the policy yet. <laughs> but yeah <laughs> made some money to do this strategy <laughs> in this. Uh, okay if we uh if anyone online so sorry um we focused on everyone in the room if anyone online would like to share how they are aligning their uh, research with the policy with uh, some framework with some agenda with some uh plan reform plan You can type up or you can turn on your microphone. That's probably even better. Feel free to, to, to turn on your microphone. Are they there? Are yeah. they there? Yeah. Is anyone there? Yeah. <laughs> there, was, some of them, there was a replacement link, so I think the oh. calendar was superseded. So oh, yeah, there's a whole lot of people on the correct one that I think it's sorry. Okay. sorry, that's why I was looking at my phone. It wasn't just so are they there? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Oh, okay, so Clem, Professor Hartley, Sammy, Duma, do you want to share how you are aligning your research? If not, it's okay. No, make them. Make them. Okay. Whom should I make? Then pick on Lindsay. Okay. Professor Hartley. <laughs> we have a question <laughs> for you. I think he's not there. Is he gonna say he's asleep? asleep. We caught him out because he's asleep. Ah, did he? Ah, doing other things. Okay. <laughs> <We're kidding. laughs> okay. Fantastic. But we uh, had some really, really worthwhile examples here. And uh, uh, we are moving on to the engagement now. So engagement as alignment. And uh, sorry, 
here's a really good research. I have a copy of an article. Feel free to email me. It's not my research. It's uh, not my original research, but this is a really good article on uh, looking how to engage appropriately to ensure that your research is uh, implemented into policy. And we already had this fabulous example of inviting all the key people to the conference and making them authors to co-create the knowledge. And then, of course, this is a little bit like with children. I'm sorry for children reference. It's when you cook food with them and then they actually eat it, <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to <laughs> you're trying to create a beautiful dish, show it to them and they say, mom, it's too spicy. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. So very similar. Uh, three successful strategies, three top strategies. So one is, of course, if they're paying you for the uh, research you're conducting, someone, no. Dylan, did you say? Yes, Dylan, your example was about exactly that, yes? So they uh, asked for your expertise and then they engaged you yeah, yeah, that's right. So, um, yeah, we have a project um, when I first joined CDU, um, the, a very large water license was approved and I got asked to make comment on it and I did and I probably shouldn't have. Uh, that project, um, so we will be working with the NT government uh, basically to improve the understanding of uh, the Western Davenport region where a very large water license has been proposed. And so, yeah, the goal of, for us is to work with them to improve their understanding of the system and therefore um, so they can manage it better. Fabulous. So of course, when uh, someone is paying for your research, uh, your findings are more likely to be implemented in whichever policy they produce afterwards. Um, second strategy is when stakeholders were involved in the design and throughout the implementation of research project. And the third one, we already heard this beautiful example, when we co-produced the knowledge and they were involved in the conference and then they even have the authorship on, on this article. Once they have the authorship, it will be silly for them not to implement it, yes? <laughs> because now they have the authorship, so it helps with the power dynamics and it helps with the further implementation of your research, further impact uh, down the the uh, further impact. Okay, we have heard uh, already of sufficient studies. Sam, do, do you think yes? In a way, we have already covered, or is there anything in particular you would like to address? No, is there anything else, anything that anyone would like to chip in that we haven't heard so far? I wanted to say you had a slide a couple just before talking about alignment and it's as though the policy came first and you have to align your research engagement equals alignment it was yes. the next one that okay. one and it's almost as though the um that you can't influence you can't nudge the policy towards your towards the science it's as though you're following the, the policy makers whereas in fact what you're trying to do is make the policy and bring the bring the um the administration along with you politicians with you which is what i was trying to do by getting them on as co-authors so they couldn't deny it <laughs> yeah in fact if you look at the the pol public policy cycles you know yes, how favorite. yeah how policy is made it's um all about kind of identifying the the problem and issue and then seeking the different types of knowledge and information stakeholder engagement in order to mm -hmm. um you know have all the knowledge that you need it, to develop the right policy mm. um so it sort of happens all that research and knowledge should should be incorporated in the the problem or the agenda setting stage before the policies are actually, before the different types of policy options are identified and then drafted and implemented and have resources aligned to them and so on. I think the biggest, the biggest thing I really want people to take away from this uh, workshop seminar is, I'm such an academic person myself. 
And I'm always thinking about cycles and policies and always frameworks. My, my book is full of frameworks and everything else, but it's also humans. Uh, the policymakers are humans, ministers are humans, everybody is a human. And uh, the biggest thing is probably that if they can be engaged, like you said, if they can be taken on the journey, then implementing will be so much easier for you and for them and for everybody else. But uh, sometimes I make this mistake with my own research as well. All I have to do is create this beautiful, beautiful piece of work. And then uh, once they will see, they will see the value of it. But every time I create this beautiful piece of work myself, um, nobody else can see the value. <laughs> so this is probably, uh, probably one of the important or I think that, that's part of the policy cycle definitely yes. it's not left out of it yes definitely uh with stake engagement with stakeholders yeah, yes you're right no okay natasha yeah okay thank you yeah. thank you so much thank you that's the uh, that's the book what we are talking about that altman uh, that's the public policy so that's the outhouse, the outhouse our favorite book Sorry, I've just got one comment slash question <laughs> observation <laughs> that so was much. partly stimulated by your mention about getting senior people as co-authors on your paper is um, it's all very well to talk about engagement, but a lot of the time decisions, but a lot of the objective scientific information that we'd like to think goes into mm. making environmental mm. decisions, which I'm more familiar with, but mm -hmm. it's the same everywhere isn't necessarily always welcome and sometimes a little bit inconvenient. So people can be a bit selective on what <laughs> information they choose to listen to. You know, and that comes, my experience is, I assume no one here's listening online, even if they were, I'd say it from that part of the world, but being involved in environmental policy and management around logging in Victoria. And so we'll frame our conservation policies from the advice of an advisory group, which we'll stack with these people that we want to be on and not yeah. those ones. That's a big challenge that we find a lot. So I like the idea of, you know, inviting all the relevant policy makers onto your paper in the first place, because they can't then deny it and say that it's irrelevant. So a lot of the challenge is finding ways to get around that, because it's very easy just to shut people out of the debate and pretend that information never existed in the first place and we didn't want to hear it. Anyway, that's my cynical take on things. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a very, it's a very good, it's very practical take on. Um, and sometimes uh, with other papers, I've invited people from with contesting views mm. um, onto the same paper, so they wrestle it out in the paper, and then come to a, a joint position. That's, this is good. No one dies on the line. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's entertaining. <laughs> they, they may never talk to each other. They might all come through me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is yeah, much, yeah. fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so that's um, engagement alignment. Oh, sorry, chat. Oh no, it's uh, it's about <laughs> uh, my work is relatively aligned. Uh, the public good as it applied in nature, carbon and water cycles. People want to know. The world seems very interested in carbon at present, a little too interested <laughs> at times. Climate policy is clearly disconnected from climate science. Oh my God, since here, the correct writing. <laughs> but that's exactly right. That's when we are thinking about policy makers. <laughs> They are doing the same thing. So uh, these policymakers that you want to influence are doing the same thing. They are logging in their flights through CTM. Uh, Chief Minister, she just told me, uh, my PA is sick. So these are exactly the things that are happening in their lives as well. To me, it's not about the things happening in their lives, but it's more that do they realize that any change in their policy or the way they design that policy has got a lot more impact on people living out there. You know, that realization, I think that's where we miss. 
Uh, they, they do realize that they do realize but sometimes it, as well it's pushed through in a way that uh sometimes you don't have a choice so basically you are um as a lawyer for example as a lawyer i have to work for both sides so if criminal comes in i'm, I'm defending criminal if a prosecution comes in and asks for my help i'm working on the side of prosecution and then as lawyers we always train to argue both sides so as a and policy officer, whoever takes this policy is a lawyer. So they are able to argue both sides. Yeah, the best people and, say yes and yes on both sides and, and you don't get anywhere. <laughs> yes, possible. <laughs> and as Sam said, information is used as weaponry as well. Yes. So yes, and your research can be used as weaponry as well. Yeah, but in developing that policy, the problem is that one can use the evidence that they want to look at yes. and ignore the others. And yes. that's what happened in climate science and many other policies. Yes. Uh, and, and I mean, so far, especially environmental aspects have been totally ignored the way our economy is run. But that's mainly because we've got bored in the way we make our policies. Yes, that's true. That's true. Uh, yes 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 that's true okay so because we have all this uh big and small issues and the world seems like it's falling apart right now and it's coming together and falling apart at the same time so uh i, I just want uh i just want probably take us to simple practical steps and uh just because we, of course we are researchers we are we tend to overthink and tend to over rationalize this or that i just want us to take to take us to the couple of simple steps that will definitely help us and help you and help uh anyone who wants to influence so of course uh and that's natasha Darwin is easier Darwin is easier and T is easier in some respects. If your research is NT based, NT news. I, I never read the newspaper, but when, we, uh, when I used to work for Parliamentary Council, then NT news is always there. When people have their morning tea, that's the first thing they open. I know by some people, NT news is not in high regard, but public servants, all of them, they do written anti news. Mm -hmm. um, something that I came across not for uh, not long ago, there is APO analysis and policy observatory. It's quite good. It's phenomenal in disseminating your research. So if you don't have a profile, all you have to do is just email them and email them your research. And sometimes they will uh, even feature it in uh, their uh, in their bridge which is a uh, bridge is the newsletter yeah, yeah yeah oh you can i can share the uh the powerpoints i can send i can send powerpoints to dylan so dylan can share it with everyone else uh and uh this uh observatory is of course open access and of course all the reports and all government reports you can also sign up for their uh for their newsletter um uh, and it will be distributed to everybody else of course this is goes without saying letter to meeting with the minister and departments um something interesting i don't know if you thought about it or not but governments including national government hardly ever has access to scopus i know scopus is very important for us as academics but basically almost okay unless it's very very wonderful uh public servant with phd and uh, a couple of his his or her own publications probability of that they're checking scopus for our articles is almost next to zero so google and uh, all public servants are going through uh, budget cutting and usually they don't have uh, access even to legal databases 
because legal databases can be expensive and all of them are looking to save costs. Of course, it goes without saying professional associations and committees and um, local associations, of course, that's boards, inquiries, royal commissions. That's ideal if you can get invited. I don't know, of course, it depends on your profile. And we had wonderful stories from uh, the group, but inquiries and um, inquiries, submissions can or sometimes don't result in action. And I don't know, for my level, even getting mentioned in those inquiries is already sufficient. But of course, and that goes to your question, Natasha. It's really, really, really hard to uh, push lobby for legislative change, especially on national level. That's probably a lot of people, they will have a lobby group and they will have association that is lobbying nonstop in order for that change to happen. So I don't think we can expect from individual research. I don't know, of course, expectations on yourself, but um, I don't think we can expect from individual research to be ever uh, high, high expectations, but still, I don't think it's very realistic that you will change the national policy, which is fantastic. You probably did. No, I, I didn't, but um, Top End Coasts did in terms of seabed mining legislation and supporting that moratorium that came in. That's a really good example of um, a community research, um, you know, stakeholder um, yeah. group coming together, Indigenous groups and organisations across the coast of the Territory to, you know, put pressure on the government to introduce a moratorium on seabed mining and change policy, which they did very successfully. We use it as a case study in environmental planning policy. Here you are, here you are, there's an example. But to say they actually have, you know, people that their, their primary role is, you know, policy advocacy and lobbying, that's what they do. They spend their whole like, country needs people. That's another example that, you know, where they manage to... Well, they um, lobby the federal government to spend more, more money on Indigenous natural and cultural resource management and they have people that that's their role they spend all, their, all day going around talking to people engaging that's exactly different groups. Right. That's, that's exactly what I mean I don't think we can expect so we were supposed to do our own research we are supposed to engage and then we're supposed to change policy on the national level it's uh, yeah but that's a phenomenal example thank you so much when we were talking with, with Sam, Sam said there, is, there are some engagement offices that they, uh, some outreach engagement offices with whom you can meet and discuss your research and uh, engage them further. And then they can pass on the information and ensure your findings are captured. But the most important today, submissions. This is uh, in light of what we have discussed that Scopus is usually not available to public servants, submissions. So you have to watch out for any time the act is getting amended. And sometimes it's being amended according to the agenda that they already want. So they will put in, in the report, there will be a questions and the questions will be already framed a certain way, the certain way the, uh, they would like this policy to be changed. But it's still uh, worth putting in submissions, even if it's not changed to legislation, it's, um, sometimes it can be changed to the policy or even simple form. One of my colleagues, she's from University of New South Wales, she's associate professor right now, and uh, she said the difference between, for her, before, between senior uh, lawyer, a senior lecturer and associate professor, was the fact that she submitted a submission to ASIC, so, so Australian Security Investment Commission, and they have changed the form just in accordance, just word to word from the submission she, uh, she submitted for their inquiry, word to word. And she based this wording on her previous research. Uh, so that's just one, one of the examples. Mm. Isn't it? 
Yeah, no, yeah. it's good. I think it's a. It's... So just uh, about the importance of submissions. Mm -hmm. Just like you have just said about the advocacy groups, about the groups, lobbying groups that they, uh, whose profession or whose sole occupation is to go off and lobby for certain changes. So here we have economic abuse reference group. We are talking about domestic violence. So this is uh, this area. And what they have done, uh, they brought all different services that probably can't lobby on their own. They brought them all together. And I just want you to pay attention to this heading. So they're calling it our publications, okay? So if we, you see here our publications, what do you expect to see? Yeah, you expect to see them, to, uh, their publications, right? Like article about this, conversation piece about that. But actually what you see is completely different. Uh, so what they're doing is sending off submissions. They're not writing articles. They're just watching for any review, for any royal commission, for any inquiry on their topic. And that's when they write submission. And that's when the government can copy paste from their submission into the form, into the policy, into something similar. Any questions, comments about this? So it's probably not less relevant for environmental impact, but I'm pretty sure you will, uh, maybe I should have made more effort and looked for environmental impact, but I thought that was a really good example how they called submissions publications. These are not publications in our mind, but they, for, their, for, for their purposes, these are publications. They're not publications no. for the ARC or the... No, the no, 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 of course not. the problems is setting aside time to do submissions when you um, don't get rewarded for it within the academic system. That's true. That's another, that's another problem. You can count these as impact now under the mm. research impact quality framework, ERA, blah, 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 that's... A CDU repository of submissions would be good. <laughs> if we don't have one already, we probably don't. <laughs> you can do it at a real level. And no your promotion one else, application. You're going to pay attention to it, whereas having yeah. a research goal is. But it doesn't bring in Commonwealth money, block grant. Right? No. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, you, and you've got to make assumptions about impact. You submit, you put in submissions. That's right. There's a next step to see your. Whether it's been your accepted or That's right. Yeah, They're yeah. taking any notice of your yeah. submission. Yeah. Good. Good discussion. It's a source of information to the research It's an indication of the ethic of the organization, isn't it? Oh, they're very useful documents. Yeah, and it's yeah. showing how each and they can see what's happened to those problems because those sorts of documents get lost because they're not really kept. With some inquiries, they yeah. add those uh, submissions in, but with some, they don't. And sometimes the website will change as well. And that, so that's really good. The parliamentary ones, they keep them. Mm -hmm. But then they got rid of the whole committee of uh, legislation scrutiny committee. And then, of course, their website is not there. So they put it in the archive and then where the submissions were transferred. Yes, humans. Everywhere are humans. <laughs> you will be surprised. <laughs> yes, humans. Humans everywhere. And uh, these are busy people and they don't have access to Scopus. If they can see it from your submission, they copy paste it and it can be translated. If they don't see it, they will, they will go to Google. Uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I think that takes us to the end of our presentation, unless we have, ah, okay, so capturing. That's probably, that's probably for more, more early career researchers when we are, this is another piece of work that we are doing. And of course, like we were just told, we have to be extremely strategic with how we are spending our time. So if we want to invest time, we definitely have to capture, and that's usually metrics, but we probably 
have limited time here. And uh, so we have to be extremely, extremely, extremely careful what exactly we want to talk about. We, are we talking about research, research and engagement? Are we talking about significance? Or are we talking about attribution? With attribution, of course, it's really, really hard to say whether your particular article impacted that uh, particular legislation change. But Natasha, in your examples, that was very clear though. The attribution was very clear. Thanks to this conversation article, this happened. Thanks to this. So in your case, all the examples that you have given so far, that was very clear attribution. So that's fabulous. Um, and when we are talking about policy, that's probably another important thing that I wanted to stress today. It's not only change to legislation. When we are, Dylan was talking about framework. Framework is considered to be policy. Policy generally defined, uh, uh, broadly defined, not only uh, legislation. Tool, device, recommendation, this is, uh, can be also considered form, particular form, particular database. Uh, Sam, Sam gave an example of the database. So this is already uh, considered to be influencing public policy. Any questions, comments? Uh, of course, I put the changes in the legislation <laughs> just to counter my own point. Uh, I will just go around the room one more time and uh, just to ask you what was useful for you today and uh, what you will do differently on Monday because today is Friday and we are all tired. That's it. And we can is pick on Sam first because he's near the microphone. Uh, uh, Sam is, can't wait to share his. <laughs> Give me five seconds. No, um, I actually just thought it was it's nice to have an interactive seminar for a change and to actually. Um, hear the input everyone does things a little bit differently all of our experiences are different so it's um good to hear that everything you've had to say but actually thanks for drawing yes, out yes, everything I think, from I think we've had incredible yeah, experience good. in the room yeah, thank yeah, you yeah. so much for contributing so, thank you for looking up that policy website i hadn't heard of that at all as a as a way APL? of getting it out yes yeah no, no, thank you thank you can I ask you for that cartoon so I can use it in one of my lectures on <laughs> opinions and I'll evidence? Share, share. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so better lectures coming soon. That's from Monday onwards. I agree with Sam. I also really enjoyed the interactiveness and learning of what, what everyone does. And what we'll do differently on Monday, we'll, we'll try to, you know, set more time aside for research. <laughs> for the beginning. Good job. <laughs> Okay, uh, I think this one is very useful information, but for Timor-Leste context, it's probably not yet for legislation for everything. But still we try to set up everything accordingly to. But with to East Timor, probably you even have better access to ministries and policy change. For you, it's even probably even that's it. You you have done your PhD in Australia. You have done amazing things. Now you can come back and you can actually make changes. No? Yes? Yeah. Thank you. And for me, it was like there's a whole heap of catalysts for poking the bear and make uh, and sort of catalyzing change. Well, I do. I actually work with a stakeholder group for Farmers for Climate Action and they have great sort of connections. So, so um, I probably need to, um, I guess, let them know where I'm at with my research. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, thanks, Gisela. I really enjoyed the, um, the the interaction active and and hearing what other people are doing is fantastic because you may not yeah. have yeah it's wonderful and also looking I work with David and Acasio on their PhDs and so yeah some great ideas I think for where their projects are heading. Thanks. Thank you. As a plant health officer and inspector, I'm mainly responsible in. Him implementing regs and legislation and it's a really great experience to see how these legislations are made up or what really goes into making this so thanks for the interaction two main things for me one is that apo website um, 
knowing what that is useful and learning from Stephen that inviting public policy that officers. Was a clever, so uh, clever. And I think that gave me the idea that within real we can have a you know channel where we can put submissions together. Uh, we got a nice mix of knowledge set within real as well. So that could be something I can start pushing on Monday. Well, we, we have done that a bit, but that's just the idea of documenting. Yeah. Well, yeah, so Kamal's just recommended that I also have to have a turn as well. I think that for me on Monday, um, well, I'll be um, trying to keep my head above water as best I can. But um, I think the one thing that came out of some of the discussions is about how we're responsible for documenting our impact now. It's sort of the, the other thing that we're expected to do. And it's probably just to, to think more about different ways that I can do that. But also with funding applications that they are asking, what was your impact in the past? Are they? So it's, but it's also, we're getting ranked on it now. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. It should be, um, it should be done by other people. Uh, asking whether this actually happened. It might be a bit depressing for you if you actually find the results. Mm. But uh, not for it shouldn't you, be the, not for you. The, well, it, it shouldn't be the the um, person actually doing the research. Mm. It's got a really important point to make about travel policy. And I once phoned up someone fairly high in CTM and asked why they always made such a mess of our travel bookings. And she said, it's basically because of the product options that CDU Travel chose when we offered them the CTM <laughs> package and we'd given them such an unwieldy set of frameworks for them to work in that it was a real nightmare for them to book our own travel for us every single time. So she blamed us, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much.